So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today on this webinar. Um, as you may know, this webinar serves to spread awareness on low vision. And it mainly came about from having Low Vision Awareness Month on in February, as well as um, Braille Day, which was held, well, commemorated on January the 4th. So we can now begin. I hope you receive all the information that we require from our presenters. And if you have any questions for our presenters, please write them out in the chat and we'll have them answered at the end. So without further delay, I would first like to introduce our first speaker. This speaker is Dr. Farnan. He's an Irish trained optometrist and has been an optometrist for more than 20 years. He came to Trinidad and Tobago in 2001 after working in both Ireland and England. He joined the University of the West Indies Optometry Program in 2013. He obtained his doctorate from Aston University in Birmingham, UK, well, United States in 2021. His specializations are contact lenses, patient care, dis patient care dispensing, and of course, low vision. Mr. Farnan, you can go, well, Dr. Farnan, you can go ahead and present. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kiyomi, and welcome everybody. And thank you for being with us on this Sunday afternoon. And I'd like to thank the TTOSA for thinking of me and inviting me on this very important topic. And I do hope you find it worthwhile. And I always challenge people when I do give a presentation. If you can take one or two pieces of information and bring it home with you and use it and change your mind, so change the way you do things, then that for me is a success. Because sometimes it's difficult to get all the information that people talk about. But as well as myself, we have two other good speakers today. And as I said, we'll have a whole lot of information for you to take home with you. So let's get started. The first thing that we're gonna talk about is what is low vision? These are the topics Xiaomi and TTOSA wanted me to talk about. What are the common pathologies leading to low vision? What are the ways to possibly counteract such pathologies? What about some advice for managing the daily life with low vision? Some common devices used in low vision and overview? And what associations in Trinidad and Tobago are available to assist those with low vision? So you know there are very technical definitions for low vision. And when one goes to the optometrist, and puts the patient on the letter charts that is a standard of vision to see. But when we think about it practically, whenever the vision of a patient begins to interfere with their daily tasks or enjoying their life, then that's when someone has low vision. And it's very important to add in that they must have that difficulties even with spectacles. Now I have contact lenses in today. And if I don't have my contact lenses in, I would never see anything on this screen in front of me. But when I put the contacts in, I can see what is there. But there are people out there that no matter what spectacles, what contact lenses, we try to increase the vision, the standard of vision still does not allow them to do their everyday tasks. Now that could be television or driving or seeing street names. Or it could be looking at the newspaper or nowadays the computer screens and the cell phones. And so they may not be able to work. They may not be able to enjoy their everyday activities. They may not be able to get the education that they were in at the time or just a daily task like going to the supermarket. Now that's not to say they cannot do those tasks because as we go along today, you'll see there's many other ways to do that. But you'll find that it isn't as easy or maybe as quick as what they used to be able to do. Now there is a definition also between what's visually impaired and what's legally blind. And a lot of people think that if you have low vision, 
then it's just all darkness. And only a small percentage of people are legally blind of all of those people who could be classified as low vision. And that's where it's very important that we have these type of webinars to educate us all that you can't fit every patient into a particular category. There's lots of different ways that people cope. And we're gonna hear that from a visually impaired person themselves later on. Now, one thing to know is that it's estimated that 80% of all visual impairment could have been avoidable. And some people think it's even higher. Now, of course, there are individuals, for whatever reason, genetics and different things, that no matter what was going to happen, that vision loss was uh, unavoidable. But many other cases that I'm going to show you soon, it could be avoidable. And that's where it's all of our jobs to be able to tell and educate the nation of what is the challenges. So what are the most common pathologies or the most common reasons why people lose, lose their vision in particularly Trinidad and Tobago and the wider Caribbean region? And glaucoma is one for sure that many people do not get the vision that they did have before. Changes to the back of the eyes because diabetes can cause significant loss of vision. People who have uncontrolled blood pressure can also cause significant challenges to the back of the eye. And everybody, accidents is another leading cause of why people lose their vision in sweet tea and tea. So what can we do? Well, glaucoma, you need to be, be aware of what glaucoma is. And that's where the pressure in a patient's eyes is too high for that particular individual eye. And it's a group of diseases, it's not just one disease. And nobody knows why particularly the pressure goes high in some people's eyes and other people's eyes, it doesn't affect them. But we need to understand that there are risk factors. Now, one of them is age. And unfortunately, we cannot avoid getting older. But also, there is a strong family history. And again, anybody who's looking in today, if you know you have glaucoma, then start telling people about it, particularly your brothers and sisters, and if you have any children. Or if you know your brothers and sisters or your parents have glaucoma, then you need to be very aware that that increases the risks. Diabetes also increases the risk of glaucoma. And there are other risks, but it is important to know. And sometimes as a culture in the Caribbean that we don't tell people our problems and we don't tell people our diseases. And many a times the patients, we ask them, does anybody have a family history of glaucoma? And they don't really know. And then when we do meet people with glaucoma, we would ask, have you told your brothers and sisters? Uh, I'm not telling anybody. But it's very important that word gets out there. Because as well as age, the whole family history is very significant. Now, even if you don't have a brother and sister or a parent who has glaucoma, just age, as I said, is a risk factor. And one of the challenges of glaucoma is that you, as a patient, will never know about it until it's five years too late for the most common type of glaucoma, because it's very, very gradual loss. And by the time you notice that the vision has gone, five years of treatment has been lost. And you know, I often say when I give these speaks that people would like a time machine if only I had known what I know now. If only I had been able to do what you're telling me what to do. If only this, if only that. And of course, 
unless you're hiding out on us and you've invented a time machine, that isn't such a thing. And people do have a lot of regrets. And people ask, what's the best way to avoid getting glaucoma? Well, there isn't any. There's no known cure when one gets glaucoma. But there are treatments to prevent it from getting worse. And so the best way anybody to look after yourself in relation to glaucoma is to get your eyes tested regularly. Because the quicker it is picked up, which again will be five years before you notice the problem, the quicker it is picked up and the quicker it may be managed. And you see also, it's fascinating to watch the whole psychology of patient care. Because, okay, we've got our eyes tested. We knew there was a family history and now it's happened to me. And then the ophthalmologist gives you some drops and somewhere along the line, information gets confused and we don't realize that those drops are for life, not just for one or two bottles. And sometimes the drops can be stingy. Sometimes the drops can make our eyes red. Sometimes the drops can be expensive. And again, remember, it's not an immediate loss of vision, the most common type of glaucoma. So you're putting drops in and then some people are expecting the vision to get better and they don't get better. And so a lot of people don't follow the treatment and then they wonder why over years their vision will gradually get more and more difficult to work with. So again, if you know anybody out there with glaucoma and they're either your parents or your brothers and sisters, get your eyes checked. And if you do know anybody who has glaucoma, again, make sure they are following the treatment, making sure they are taking the drops. Some people take them at night, some people take them during the day. It's very, very important that we follow the treatment. But what about diabetes? And you'll see it all boils down to the same thing. Be aware of what diabetes is. Be aware of your own health. And there's a big, big movement in healthcare now that it's the patient's health. And the patient isn't charged. Everybody can only do so much, but it is the patient who's in charge. And so again, if you're suddenly drinking an awful lot more water or sweet drinks than never before, you need to be aware. If you're suddenly going to the bathroom a lot more than ever before, you need to be aware. And then the thing that some people actually think is a benefit, but if you're suddenly losing weight, for no reason, you haven't been exercising, you haven't been going on a diet, but you're losing weight. It's not a miracle. Something is happening. You need to be aware. And then you need to be aware of the dangers of diabetes. And you need to be aware that the reason why people have these complications is because the sugar level is going out of control. And you know, we get a lot of patients coming in and they make a lot of excuses why their sugar level's high. Oh, I just had a sweet drink, or I just had some roti, or I just did this, or I just did that. But it's not the case because of just that. It's over time and we're not balancing our diet. And you know, some people think diabetes is a life sentence. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't mean you can never eat ice cream again. You can never eat pizza. It just means you have to be able to eat it in moderation or understand the consequences of these high carbohydrate foods. And again, you'd be very surprised if you meet a patient with diabetes, you ask them when is the last time they've had their eyes examined. And some of them have never had their eyes examined since they become diabetic. And again, by the time a patient's noticed that diabetes has affected the eye, it's way too late. And an easy once a year examination can make the difference between being able to do your daily tasks at ease or needing some help. And again, a lot of people don't understand or get confused about the diabetic medication. They don't take it, they only take it when they feel sick. 
But again, by the time you feel sick, that sugar level has gone all over the place. And sometimes, again, the treatment does have some side effects. You can gain weight, you can feel nauseous, but it's important to make sure you understand the consequences of not following that treatment. And then some people go on to insulin and you have to inject yourself. And again, that makes that cycle even worse because people then either don't inject themselves or they need someone else to inject themselves. Hypertension, the same thing. What is your lifestyle? Are you a heavy smoker, a heavy drinker? Do you not have a balanced diet? Do you not do exercise? Is there a family history of high blood pressure in your family? And again, high blood pressures can affect the eyes. So again, it's just a matter of getting the eyes checked regularly. And again, you'll hear people say, oh, I only take the medication when I feel the pressure being high. But again, colleagues, whenever you feel the pressure being high, it's been high too long, too late. And again, if it, if it is one little tablet you have to take and exercise and control your diet, stop smoking, stop drinking, that could be the difference between being able to do your daily tasks and having challenges on it. And then trauma and accidents, the number of stories that we have heard, because for whatever reason, people didn't seem to foresee this accident happened. They weren't wearing their seatbelts. They weren't wearing their goggles when they were doing stuff in the garden or when they were doing woodworking or metalwork. And then when we see people in the clinic, sometimes they'll say, well, yeah, I got a piece of metal in my eye. Oh, okay. How long ago? Well, six months ago. And they're only coming now because they somehow think the eye, eye is going to heal itself. Oh, I got a lash to my eye, doctor. Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh. How long ago? Three years ago. And it's only now that you've noticed the vision isn't as good as... No, no, ever since. So what made you come in today? Oh, well, the license office told us to come in or something like that. So the first rule of trauma accidents is try to prevent them in the first place. And if there is a high risk of it happening, use protection. And God forbid, if something does happen, do seek help as soon as you can. Now, I'm sure our next speaker will be able to give us a lot more of two speakers today, a lot more different tips. But you know, one of the things about low vision is that it is and can be quite depressing for people when they first realize the vision is not coming back. And so I will always tell anybody you need to seek help. And again, it can be difficult sometimes admitting help, particularly if you don't accept that you have lost your vision or that you are losing your vision. But there's many great optometrists out there, there's many great ophthalmologists and there's many great associations out there that can help you if you have lost your vision. And then sometimes you feel like we're the only person who has this problem, when in fact there's many other people out there. And it's great to meet people with the same problem. So again, you can share tips, share your experience and not to feel that isolated. Another great tip is to label everything. So when you're in the cupboards, when you're looking even for the remote control, when you're trying to look at the various papers that you might need, label everything in the fridge, everything. You can make it tactile so it has a rough surface for coffee, a smooth surface for tea, lots of different hints. And I know the speakers today will definitely expand on that. And a lot of these are not that challenging. You can make things bigger. So magnify making the things bigger. And if you do have someone living in your house with low vision, Try to organize the sitting room, organize the TV room, organize the kitchen so there's not things down on the ground that can trip people over. Well, don't move the furniture around unless you start telling people. Try not to have magazines on the ground where people can uh, strip on them and fall off these plastic bags you get out of the supermarket. Try not to have cables along the ground. Try not to leave cups and saucers and different things. 
When you have low vision, it's important to be patient with yourself and others. And then when you know people who have low vision, it's again, it's important to be patient with yourself and others. They may still be able to do the task, but maybe not as fast as you expect them to do it. Or you may want to do that task and now you cannot do it. And like any skill, practice, practice, practice. So whether it's braille, using the white cane, using the magnifier, using the telescope, using the large print books, using the computer screens, it is practice. Now, you know, everybody, the other biggest tip that I can give and the biggest resource and the biggest help that we can give low vision people is the nation of Trinidad and Tobago itself. So let's work together to understand that just because you lose your vision, it doesn't mean we've lost everything else. And sometimes some people put us in corners when you lose your vision, as if you've nothing else to offer in life. So when you do see someone crossing the road with low vision, then help them. Don't cross the road the other side. When you see someone in a crowd who appears to have low vision, bring them in to the conversation, introduce who's there. When you have to finish that conversation, make sure you tell the person that you have left. If you know someone who needs challenges because they love to read the Bible and now they cannot see the Bible, there's many apps out there, or maybe you could read the Bible for them and put it onto a file and send it to them. But sometimes when people lose their vision, they are isolated and also meant to feel worthless and we need to be better than that. Now, I have said this story many times, but in case for those of you who have not heard it, I was very fortunate to be asked to a training session in Hong Kong, for low vision. And I arrived there a couple of days before the training course start because of time difference and everything. And I was walking around the city center of Hong Kong. And when you go into a shopping mall, a lot of the phrase is in Braille. They also have visual guidelines for the patients to walk into the different shops. They also have tactile guidelines for walking into the mall. When you go into the metro station, it's obvious when the metro station steps start because there's tactile rough pavement. So then the person knows where to go and grab the railings to go down. In the metro, in the subway, it tells you what the next station is. It tells you whether the left door, the right door, and then again, as soon as you get off the metro, there are visual guidelines on how to get back up onto the main street. Well, I was very impressed. And when I had the first day of the course, I said to the instructor, <coughs> I said, Joseph, you must have an awful lot of low vision people in Hong Kong because everywhere it is set out for them. And he says, you know, Niall, no. We have the same percentages of low vision people as any other country. But the government of Hong Kong decided, after all, these people are still people who have just lost their vision. So why should we make their lives difficult? And that training center, if you had lost your vision, you could become a radio announcer. You can become a news announcer. You can become a computer programmer. You could be a librarian. You could make apps. You could be into music and music production. They have a whole section of careers for people who have lost their vision. And then you come back to the Caribbean, and what happens then? As I said, people try to bounce you down on the road. People won't let you on the buses. People won't help you. People won't bring you there. People won't bring you here. And it's very sad to see because again, they are still our fellow citizens. They have just happened to lose their vision. So what are the devices that we can use for low vision? I know Mr. Mohammed is gonna go through these in more details, but just an overview, you can get hand magnifiers and many of us are used to that, like the Sherlock Holmes, we come with our magnifiers. We can get stand magnifiers. So again, if you want to read for long times, we can get telescopes if people want to see the cricket scores, what's happening into the distance, and then electronic viewers for long reading of documents. 
but this is the traditional CCTV. Nowadays, kind of heavy and expensive. You can get dedicated electronic viewers. Nowadays, our simple cell phone can do a wonderful job. And again, I have met many people who are visually impaired who are well able to work their way around a cell phone a lot quicker than some teenagers I have seen. And their messages are read out. They know when their next appointment is, et cetera, et cetera. But as I said, Mr. Muhammad, I believe, is going through that. Now, there are people out there who are willing to assist. And two great organizations is the Trinidad and Tobago Blind Welfare Association. And also today, we have people from persons associated with visual impairment, PAVI. And I encourage you all to listen to the gentleman, Mr. Prasad and PAVI. Because again, it's very important we hear from the people themselves who are dealing with the issues that we may not be under unaware of without making sure we get educated, which is why it's excellent that we're having this low vision webinar. So again, I thank you for listening. And as Kiyomi says, I look forward to any questions. I thank you all for being here. And I thank again the TTOSA for thinking of me. And I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kiyomi. Thank you, Mr. Fanon, for that presentation. I haven't seen if we got any questions in the chat, so we'll move on to our another speaker. So our other speaker for this webinar today would be Mr. Ibrahim Mohammed. So Mr. Mohammed graduated in 2017 from the UE Optometry School and is currently working at the CBRS, which is the Caribbean Vitreous and Retina Surgery Limited and Trinidad Eye Hospital. He's a principal optometrist for the past five years. He has a special interest in public health optometry. I would like to introduce you all to Mr. Ibrahim Mohammed. Thank you. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Thank you for the introduction, Mrs. Pierre, Ms. Pierre. Good afternoon, Dr. Fanon, Mr. Fassad, and everyone else in attendance. This afternoon, I'll be doing a very short presentation on the low vision services that are offered at CVRS and the Trinidad Eye Hospital. Before I start, could you all see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay. So please feel free to ask me any questions at any time during the talk, or you could send them um, on the chat. So why do low vision? Our clinic routine at CVRS is centered upon shared care. And what this means, there is a direct referral system between the optum and the ophthalmologist. The ophthalmologist will sometimes send patients who are in need of spectacles or further intervention to the optometrist after management from their side. So since I started working in 2017, I noticed a need for this clinic. So I decided slowly, but to start it up. So for example, we may have a new patient that came into our clinic and was seen by an ophthalmologist. And after managing the patient as best as possible, the patient is then sent to me for further assessment. If the patient is diagnosed as low vision, then a low vision exam will be carried out to help maximize the patient's residual vision. Patients will also be referred to the Blind Welfare Association for further care and to begin the rehabilitation process. Low vision exams are currently done right now by our optometrists at San Fernando and St. Augustine office. A low vision exam usually takes much longer than a regular eye exam. We must always pay special interest to certain tests, including history taking, visual acuity testing, contrast sensitivity testing, the refraction, visual field testing, and also selecting the low vision aid both optical and non-optical devices. So in terms of the low vision aid that we offer at CVRS and TH, we currently stock a few options, including most of them, Mr. Fanon, Dr. Fanon, sorry, would have mentioned before. We have pocket magnifiers, which are small and lightweight, ideal for patients to keep with them at all times. These are available with four times, four, five, and seven times magnification. We also have stand magnifiers, 
which are much larger. It's ideal for reading and can also have LEDs in light installed within them. We also have TV spectacles with magnified objects from 10 feet away. It's hand-free and provides about a two magnification. This is useful for low vision patients when watching television, sporting events, or any other distance viewing activity in which a magnified view may be helpful. We also have pH magnifiers as well as bar magnifiers for reading. Chest magnifiers are made to be hands-free, so persons will be able to do tasks such as sewing or clipping nails much easier. There is also a digital magnifier option called Easy Read, which can be connected to a television or computer. This option provides better lighting and contrast as well as a range of magnification powers. Another hand-free option we call the OptiVisor can also be used similarly to the chest magnifier. There are also different powers which can be clipped on depending on the task one is doing. Moving on, we have non-optical devices as well, such as filters, reading stands, typoscopes, large print watches, and a lot more. Our latest addition to the low vision device list includes bioptic telescopes with around four different options to choose from. The first one seen on this slide, slide is called the side scope. It can be mounted onto specs or attached and flipped when needed. It features a Galilean design with two magnification options, 1.7 and 2.2. This is usually recommended for patients who are 2100 or better. There is also a reading caps which can be placed onto the telescopes to convert them into a high power reading spectacle. The VES telescope, which is seen in the pictures here, is a much newer design. It's much lighter with better optics. The telescope is a capillarian design and can take into consideration prescriptions from around minus, to minus 10 to plus 10 in power. It can be manually focused from turning a wheel at the front. And this particular one is recommended for patients with around 2300 or better vision. There is also a mini design, which is seen at the photo below. Sorry, on top. The, this one also provides a magnification of around three and is recommended for patients 2150 or better. Lastly, also available in terms of bioptic telescopes, we have the Instamount telescope, which can be fitted within the lens of the spectacle and also uh, something called a field expander, but actually minifies the view to give patients with tunnel vision or peripheral vision loss a wider field of view. This is especially good for glaucoma patients. Each, one, each type of these glasses also includes filters that can be clipped over the spectacles for better vision. In terms of rehabilitation and grants in Trinidad and Tobago, after a low vision assessment, patients should be referred to the Blind Wealthy Association and PAVI for low vision rehabilitation and other benefits that they are able to provide. Low vision rehabilitation can include services such as orientation and mobility training, occupation and educational help, as well as counseling. I'm sure Mr. Pasal will speak a, a lot more about the different programs they offer at PAVI. Blind Welfare last year also launched a discount card and benefit program for Worldside Day, so its members will get discounts at certain stores in terms of grants, under the government, visually impaired persons can qualify for disability grants of different amounts depending on age. This process usually involves getting a social disability form from the ministry office and, have it, and having it filled out by a government doctor. The doctor must state the level of visual impairment in a percentage for a person to qualify. Um, I'm not sure about the exact percentage because I think, I believe different districts have different percentages needed to qualify. So that is basically what we provide to our patients. In the future, we wish to do more to educate and inform patients on low vision and what can be done. This will also lead to expansion of the low vision database so more patients could get help. The Trinidad Eye Hospital, is also working on a sponsorship program similar to our charity surgery initiative to provide financial help for those patients who require spectacles and also low vision devices. 
Right, and that's it. Any questions? Thank you so very much. I'm not seeing any questions in the chat, but we would leave it open for if anyone has questions, we can bring it back up at the end of, of the session. No problem. So thank you again for this presentation. It was very informative. Thank you. Thank you for including me. No problem. So we now we will go on to our third and final speaker. And this speaker is the current president of PAVI, which is Persons Associated with Visual Impairment. He was a founding member of, his organi of this organization and has served in various capacities on the executive. He's also the organization's representative on the ex executive of the Caribbean Council for the Blind. He was the first vice president of the Consortium of Disabled Organizations in Trinidad and Tobago, as well as representing the organization at the Commonwealth Disabled People's Forum. This person is also currently the host on the PAVI segment on Talk City 91.1, which is held on the last Wednesday of each month. And he hosts a, hosts a segment on disability on Sky 99.5 FM every other Wednesday in association with the Church of the Firstborn Assembly. He loves cricket and currently serves as the administrator for the blind cricket in the West Indies and is the first vice president of the World Blind Cricket Limited. He was born blind, but has had the good fortune of traveling extensively because of work with some of the agencies mentioned above. He's happily required, but continues to be fully occupied. And we would like to introduce Mr. Bawani Passad. Thank you very much, Kiyomi, for that um, you know, little bio there. And good evening to everyone. Well, my task is basically to talk about PAV. The first thing we must understand is why PAV. During the 90s, work for the blind was going into a new field, the phase of official training. That is how to use the white cane, how to do things uh, with, in, a, in a different way. So PAVI was formed with that in mind. And so our emphasis was on the area of rehabilitation, what we now refer to the, as adjustment to blindness. Prior to that, many of us who were blind learned through trial and error or each one teach one but we did not have the right technique. So when the right techniques were introduced to us in the Caribbean, to the Caribbean Council for the Blind, it is there and then that we decided we want to do what is right for all of us. You know, as previous speakers have said, people treat blind persons or low vision people very differently at times because they don't know. And even some of us who are blind and visually impaired do not know, and hence the need for the training program to get you up to speed. The training program includes orientation and mobility. That is teaching you basic cane technique, how to use a cane properly, and how to navigate your way around. For example, you were once sighted, but you became blind. And you thought it was the end of the world. But no, it is not. You can still move around using a white cane or whatever devices you use. Well, I know some low vision people don't really use their cane because they have enough vision to take them around. But we always advise them to walk with your cane, even in your bag. So when you enter a difficult situation, you will be able to use your cane to maneuver and for people to recognize that you have some visual challenge. Because there are some people 
who think and believe that because you're not using a cane, even though you are certified as low vision, that you're playing tricks, that you want to go to the front of the line and you're not blind. So we always advise people about having that cane and using it from time to time to remind yourself and to remind persons that you do have a visual problem. The training component also includes daily living skills. When you were sighted, a lot of the things you took for granted. But when you lost your sight, you finally decided, well, look, you see me? I cannot see no more. So I am just going to sit here and await help. But no, as I always say, there is life after blindness. You have to do things. You may have to do it a little different with some modification, but you will certainly get the job done. There are very, there are very few jobs that a blind person cannot do. One of which is driving. We might be able to drive you up a wall, but we can't drive you from, from point A to point B. However, Given the advance in technology today, there are almost everything else that we as blind and visually impaired persons or people who've lost their sight can continue to function. And the objective here is not to make you dependent on your family, your friends, but to make you as independent as possible. Yes, it will take some doing, it will take some getting used to. It will take swallowing your pride because there are still many persons who believe, why must I go out there? Because I am blind. I don't want my friends to see me. I don't want to be seen in public. But you have to continue with your life. Life has to go on. You don't know how long you're going to live as a blind person, whether it's 10, 20, 30, 40, or even more years. So you have to prepare yourself for that transition. This program also works with family members to help them understand your situation and how they could assist you in dealing with it. And that is why counseling for both family members and the persons so affected is very important. And at the end of the day, the end result will be a more, a more efficient person who's not just lost his, his or her sight, but who's able to still contribute. There are those who be, feel and believe that blind persons cannot continue to cook, that blind persons cannot wash their clothes, or that blind persons cannot sweep the house. Yes, they can still do it with adaptation, modification. And that is what the rehab slash adjustment to blindness program is all about. Teaching you to be as independent as possible and not just dependent. And I have heard many stories where persons who have lost their sight have accepted the training and have used the training to the max so that when their loved ones come home, they know they, might, they would be able to get something, a meal prepared, perhaps the house swept, perhaps the clothes washed, and these little things, you understand? So as I always say, there is life after blind. There are many other things which a blind person can use effectively. Now I heard Mr. Fano mention about reading the Bible. Yes, there are audio Bibles. You can even download the Bible on your, on your smartphone now, and it can read it for you. And you can use your smartphone very easily. Some of us manage to do it very effectively, touching the screen. Some of us manage to do it using a keyboard. And some of us, we depend on Siri or some other assistive device to help us navigate through using our phone. We have a lot of devices 
within the fold of, of ensuring that you are as efficient as possible. And they range from bathroom scales, kitchen scales, uh, even uh, talking thermometers. So you could take your own blood pressure, you could take your own sugar pressure, uh, sugar, you could test your own sugar, sorry, and, and you could do other things. The sky is the limit. Unfortunately, though, for some of us, these pieces of gadgets and devices can be costly. But here is one way of getting around. So you need a thermometer. Let's assume it costs $300. Whether it's CT or yes, it costs $300. What you do is to tell family members, friends, well wishers, you want to give me something? Put towards me buying that thermometer or put towards me buying XYZ. Give me as a Christmas gift. A birthday gift, you know, change from the from the method of clothes and 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 and, and gadgets, and even for young blind persons, you know, you, you 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 want to give them toys and all of these things. Let them have the devices that they can use very appropriately. Now, Pavi's rehab slash adjustment to blindness program, because of the pandemic, one has been put on hold. You know, all the thing about social distancing and you can't go into people's home, et cetera. And two, we have been strapped financially. So we are unable to provide the services at this time. But we can provide counseling. We can talk one-on-one -on -one with you. And the best person to talk to somebody who is losing sight is someone like him or herself who's gone through that. So you could help to build confidence. You could help to strengthen that person so they could then say, if you can do it, well, I can do it too. Of course, the Blind Welfare Association is another agency as mentioned by Mr. Fana. And they provide a number of services. Thankfully, they are funded totally by government so that they don't have to worry about where they're getting the next dollar from for the most part. They, they have the, the, the funding and all they have to do is deliver. But what I tell people is whether it is PAVI, whether it is Blind Welfare, or any such agency offering a service, offering a course, go ahead and take it. In fact, at one time, PAVI used to train people in computer uh, technology. And Blind Welfare used to train you in computer technology too. But I'm sure from the two teachers, you may pick up something a little different. So there is no harm in taking as many courses as you want to take, as you can afford to take, as you're desirous of taking. But you will benefit in the long run because not everybody's style of teaching might be the same. So I always encourage persons who are losing sight or who have lost sight that go ahead and do the courses that are available and encourage them to you know access the services that are available by any agency you understand don't just say well look i don't want to go to favi because or i don't want to go to blind record because we are all in the same field working for the same cause that is to help you the blind and visually impaired person empower yourself regroup and as the young people say come again Strengthen your independence, your degree of independence. Now, there are even things like clothes markers and stuff like that, which um, you, you, you can use to mark your clothes so you know that you know, the color of this shirt is black because there is a marker which says BL. And hence the reason why Braille, I, I, when, you get, when you're losing sight or have lost sight, is very important. Now, I will admit it is a bulky thing especially if you're going down to bring books, et cetera. But it is a handy tool when you have to label things. It is handy so you don't have to depend on, on anybody sometimes to tell you what is in your cupboard. You, you, you will pack things away to suit you. Now, Mr. Fana mentioned a, a very important point. When you fix a place, always make sure and orient the person 
who is blind in your household so that they will be aware that you have moved around the furniture. Nothing wrong with moving it around from time to time, and, but always make them aware. And, and, and this is a simple technique. If you move something, put it back from where you moved it as far as humanly possible. So that if I go for, for a cup and realize that the, the, the stand which holds the cup has gone to a different location, I might be feeling a wrong in vain. You know, so all of these things are very important tips. Pave has worked with all ages of blind persons and will continue to do so once we have the necessary funding. Starts with the early intervention program where we prepare mothers and teachers of or parents and teachers of young blind persons between zero to seven so that they will be prepared for the school environment. And then we work with youth, we work with adults, we work with senior citizens, and we have also created support groups so that if, if there is a support group in your area, at least once a month, you can get somebody to take you there or to drop you there, you know, so that you can be a participant in that support group and be able to socialize, be able to mingle, be able to meet new friends. Because I could tell you from experience, that many persons who've lost their sight don't, don't really get the opportunity to go anywhere with their families too much because the families are still thinking in, in, in the negative way. Or if they see me with my husband or my wife who is blind, what are they going to tell me? You know, all of these questions come up. Um, and, and then people tend to watch you hard, very, very hard. So it, it puts a scare sometimes um, on, on the person who is going out with you. Why they watch them as so, so up, you know? So you get a, there's still a lot of stigmatization around. But it is only when we are seen, or when the blind person is seen, that acceptance will come sooner than later. Now, I know that for me, being born blind is a little different from someone who's lost their sight, let's say, as a full grown adult, you know? But at the same time, you, there are ways and means of coping. There are ways and means of adjusting. So you have to take your pride away and begin to accept your reality. Now, there are some people who say, well, I'm waiting for God to bring back my sight. Yes, God is a miracle worker. There's no doubt about that. And if it happens, it happens. If it does not, you have to live with it. There are many blind persons who live on their own and they do so very efficiently and very effectively because they have been um, oriented, they have learned some of the skills and as, I, as I mentioned above. So they, can, they, they try to live as independent as possible. They may not get it right all the time or they may not be able to do things like the average sighted person, but they do it to the best of their ability and with the training they have received. So, in closing, all I want to say is that there is life after blindness. There is no shame having a disability, blindness or any type of disability. It happens and it happens for different reasons sometimes. The, the, the top of the list would be the, the diseases and then um, you know, things like accidents and that kind of stuff follow. But nevertheless, as we say, where there's a will, there's a way. Pavi, not only cares about those who are losing sight, but we also care about preventing blind. And so some of our outreach initiatives is to help you, like this one that we are doing here today with the uh, TNT um, Optometry Students Association, is to help you to understand that, you know, it is important to take care of your eyes, it is important to value it, and it is important to do what is required with it so that you, you preserve your sight as long as it's humanly possible. With these few words, I thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Mr. Fassad. That was so informative. I'm seeing here. Okay. Yes. 
So we'll open the chat, see if there are any questions now. Um, I'm seeing here. Um, yes, so we would, um, we are recording this session so that we can make it available on our social media website. We would send the link um, to our website, our Facebook, as well as our Instagram, so that you all can obtain it from those websites. Well, are there any questions or have we spoken so well or we put people to sleep? All three of us, that is. <laughs> I think you all spoke very well. All the information was very well presented. So I don't see that there are any questions pertaining to the presentations right now. Perhaps we should share some contact information. Yes, that would be good if you can um, share okay. contact on the chat. Well, okay, you could always pick that up from the office. In my case, sorry, but but, but, but let me maybe Google and Sepavi. We are located at thirty two Eastern Mary St. Augustine. Uh, our telephone number is two two zero one zero seven three, and our office is open from nine a.m. to three p.m. on the Friday. We do have a Facebook page, Pavi Trinidad, and we have recently um, established our website, pavitt.com, so that we are in the social media arena. And of course, we do have our radio programs and other um, avenues by which we share information. Great, thank you so very much for that. I'm surprised, um, I'm surprised that nobody asked about cricket. Well, actually, I'm glad that you reminded me. Yes, I, I've never heard of the, the blind cricket team. That's very interesting to hear about. Is that yeah. just in Trinidad or that is? No, 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 uh, that is worldwide. We have, we have cricket all over the world. In fact, um, we have uh, most of the conventional cricket team countries are members of, of the blind cricket movement. And we have tournaments, we have had tournaments in the region and we have international tournaments. In fact, I um, before coming to this um, presentation, I was talking to my colleagues in Guyana who are preparing to host a regional tournament in August so that we can pick two teams, one to go to India in November for T20 World Cup and one to go to England for the World Blind Games well, that, the England team will be a, a, a women's team to go to the World Blind Game in, um, in Birmingham, England in 2023. So <clears throat> blind cricket is one of the many sporting avenues that blind persons can get involved in. There is football, which I, I am not too keen on. Um, there is gold ball, people play dominoes, people play cards, drafts. You know, everything has modifications and we can play as, as near normal as possible. Okay, wow, that's very interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Um, okay, so I'm actually getting a question about that. Um, someone would like to know, how do you all play cricket or train for these sports? Okay, basically, we follow most of the rules of conventional cricket, save and accept that the ball has beads in it. So that it rolls along the ground. You cannot bowl over, over arm bowling. All the bowling must be on the arm. Now the batsmen are three categories uh, depending on the strike level. And the totally blind ones uh, are regarded as B1. Now, interestingly enough, every run scored by a B1 is doubled. So for example, if you want eight runs to win and you have one ball left and the, and the, and the batter who is a B1 hits that ball, that automatic automatically comes as eight. And that's an easy way of winning. Uh, uh, you know, and, and there is avenues for the B1, who is totally blind, to take as integral a part in the game because B1s must bowl a certain number of overs within the over rate and stuff like that. So everyone is involved. Now, the B1s will run for themselves first to begin. Um, the B2s who have a little more vision, some of them could run for themselves depending on the level of vision. But the B3s are the ones who do all the external outside fielding, etc. The, 
the pitch is 22 years, like a conventional pitch. And of course, um, okay, I, I see a question coming up. Where do the games take place? Well, for the last year or so, because of the COVID, we, we used to practice at um, Ellingburg and Shabonas there. And, and then the games, we have, as I said, regional tournaments. We've had two regional tournaments in Trinidad, and we take it around the region. And as I indicated, we are hoping to go to Guyana this year for the regional tournament. But um, we do play games amongst ourselves, amongst with other people. So if the Trinidad and Tobago, um, your organization, wants to organize a game amongst with, with us, um, we'll, be keen, we'll be keen to enter into discussions but you play by our rules, not by yours. <laughs> okay, so we have another question. How can someone join the team? Well, basically you must be certified blind. Then secondly, you come out to our practice sessions and whatnot. And then if you're selected, if you're good enough and selected to go and play regional or international tournament, so be it. Um, you know, but you must be certified um, visually impaired or totally blind. You just don't come and blind and blindfold yourself. But in the case of when we play sighted teams, we don't even, we don't even ask you to blindfold. You just play by our rules. That is bowling the ball on the arm and stuff like that. Okay. And, well, we have beaten, and we have beaten teams in the past. Eh? Oh, interesting. Yes. That is really interesting. Oh, we have another question. Um, with regards to the support groups for the low vision patients, what's the procedure for them to join the groups? Well, what they can do is to, to get in touch with our office. And when we're having a support group um, meeting, in, depending on where we're having it, then we invite you. Because for example, uh, we, we, we try to spread the groups around so that you know, it's not a, a, yes. Okay, it's not, it's not centrally located. For example, we have a group in Superia, St. Patrick. We have a group in Curep. We have a group in Coover for the time being. But if we get an increased number of persons in any geographic location who are blind and or visually impaired, we will certainly set up the, the support groups so that they too. We had, in the early days, we had groups in Arima, Port of Spain, and, and the like. So, you know, depending on, on the volume of persons, the number of persons we get, then we, uh, and the demand is there for a support group, then we activate the support. Ah, okay. Completely understand. I hope that answered the question for you to the person who sent it in. Yeah, to the person who said they, 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 they went to a blind cricket game in point fourteen and didn't understand it because they didn't have the real commentator, which is yours truly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the next time we have a cricket game, yours truly will be there. Oh, lovely. We should really set that up. I would love that. Okay, so are there any more questions? Well, please looking forward. Okay, so I don't think there are any more questions right now. I have other questions for our first two guests though. Based on the pandemic um, over the last two years, have you seen an increase in patients coming for service? I mean, whilst this, the, the, the service was stopped for a while, um, are you seeing, are you now seeing more and more patients um, you know, keen to use the services that you all offer in terms of cleaning, et cetera? Or is there still a heavy reluctance? Well, I, I can answer that, Mr. Basad. In, in relation to the University of Palmetry Clinic, unfortunately not. You know, we also have a low vision clinic uh, in the UE of Palmetry Clinic. 
And, and as you said, I mean, your, your, your presentation was wonderful to, to get that insight into, you know, people's way of thinking that, that the mere fact of going to, to the low vision clinic, you know, is an acceptance in itself. And, and if people haven't accepted that they've lost their vision or losing their vision, then they won't come. Uh, and, you know, it's a shame that, that we also have the resources and the Trinidad, Trinidad Eye Hospital have the resources. And there are lots of resources. And, and even like Cashel was saying, Pavi has a support group, but sometimes people don't want to join the support groups. And just like what you were saying, people are not willing to go outside with or without their spouses, et cetera. So um, I would say even more so with the pandemic, it's definitely made life a lot difficult for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, we, we do have the capacity to help more people, but it is that first step of acceptance, which is always the, the challenge for many people. In, um, in my clinic, it's basically, the numbers have been more or less constant, but this year, I think we, we recently started back our vision screening, our diabetic eye screen and all those things. And the numbers started to increase from that when we do our outreach. Yes, because I, I realized that you're partnering with the Diabetes Association for your outreach. Yeah, um, that's with the deaf team. Yeah, and, and, and then with um with Pab, because we probably was part of one of those. Yeah, we did the, the talk on the radio, um, I think it was last year, last year or year before. No, no, no. I'm talking about the, uh, the we did a, 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 a downstairs party office sometime last month or something with the right, right. Hospital and the diabetes. Yes, you see, yeah, the diabetic ice cream. Mm -hmm. Okay, so any other questions from anyone? No? Okay, so I would just like to ask just one question um, to Mr. Balani. How do you think mm -hmm. that we as well citizens and optometry students and optometrists, how can we continue to support those who are visually impaired and continue to spread awareness to assist them? Well, you've started the process away already to, sp to spread the awareness. It's just that the numbers that you anticipated based on, what, on our discussion have not yielded, although this, this was given some, some coverage on various platforms, social media, et cetera. And, and that is one of the problems. People believe that this can happen to me or it's not me they're talking to or whatever. They don't know the value of good information. They will go on TikTok and spend hours, but to come here for 90 minutes, that's a big problem for some of them. Yes, that is, that is very but true. But we, we have to continue what we're doing. We have to continue. We cannot give up, you know? Yes, I completely agree there. Well, hopefully that we can continue spreading awareness and con continue to help those who are visually impaired. Um, maybe possibly by adding to the social media, because you mentioned TikTok, and I think the thing is we really have to try and keep up to date with all these social media trends, because that is you know, what is in now and how information is being spread really fast on those platforms. So I think we have to try and adapt it if possible to, to spread awareness just as much as, you know, we will share like a meme or a video. So I think that is all. Um, again, if there's anyone else, you all can feel free to send any um, questions. But if that is it, I would like to close off. So, um, Thank you to all the presenters. Oh, sorry, we have one more question. Um, they are chatting right now. They're, sorry, typing right now. So one moment.
Okay, if we can just be patient. I trust my background music is not troubling you all because somebody no, trying to set up. Very good. Okay, so question for Mr. Mohammed with regards to bioptics. Um, with regards to bioptics research is being done. Okay, one second, sorry. Yes, right. So with regards to bioptics, research is being done where sensors are placed in the brain in hopes of restoring vision. Do you think that this may be applied to the Caribbean once it is finalized? Well, to be honest, I'm not too sure, I'm not too familiar with, um, with this research, what is being done. But um, one thing in terms of low vision, we, we tend to be a little um, in the back in terms of technology um, that we have available in the Trinidad and the Caribbean compared to what is being done in first world countries. So even with um, stuff like bioptics, and it, there is a lot more technological advanced devices for low vision, it tends to reach the Caribbean very late. And I think the biggest reason for that is the cost of those things. Mm -hmm. um, but with, I guess in the future, depending how things go, it may, it once, once it have sponsorship programs, once it have companies willing to invest, then for sure those things would be available. Okay, thank you so much for answering that. I hope that answered, yes. So they said thank you for that. Okay, so I guess we would wrap up this now. Again, I would just like to tell everyone, thank you for making the effort for coming out on this Sunday evening. You know, we could be eating our macaroni pie and watching TV, but it is good that we chose to come and join into this webinar today. I would like to hand over to the Vice President, Mr. Anil Ram Ramsaram, to do the closing remarks now. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, firstly, I would like to conclude by saying it's indeed a great pleasure for all of us to be gathered here um, on this Sunday to discuss and bring awareness to Low Vision Month, Braille Day, and also bringing val valuable knowledge to those who are like visually impaired. Um, we, the executive at TTOSA, would like to formally thank the wonderful guest speakers, Dr. Fanon, Mr. Mohammed, and Mr. Pasad, for your amazing contribution, wisdom, and assistance with setting up and discussing all the uh, topics and to all the participants as well and listeners that was present during the webinar. Lastly, before we close off, there is a short questionnaire that is going to be sent to the chat. If you would kindly um, answer the few questions that are being generated. Um, we thank you and hope you remain safe I miss the COVID pandemic and hope you all have a wonderful Sunday evening. Thank you all, everyone. Thank you, Arnold. Thank you, Kiyomi. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. <laughs>